Welcome to this Aspiring Medics tutorial on medical ethics. My name's Luke, and in this session, we're going to be looking at capacity. So firstly, we're going to look at what capacity is in medicine, then an explanation of how capacity varies with age and mental status, then some tips and tricks on how to tackle a question on capacity, and finally, we're going to look through a mock question together. So capacity is the ability to utilize information about an illness and treatment options and make an informed decision congruent with one's own values and preferences. So in more basic terms, it's the ability to understand the risks and benefits of a procedure and make a decision. And so its importance in medicine is it's the key to autonomy. So we need to know that a patient understands the decision that they're making and they understand the implications of that decision if we're going to give them full autonomy. And also for consent, um, a patient must give permission for any form of medical treatment to take place. So that's a definition of consent. Um, and it must be voluntary, it must be informed, and the patient must have capacity in order to um, consent to a treatment. So we see that capacity is key in two senses here. It's key for autonomy and it's key for consent. So therefore, it's really important to understand when a patient does and does not have capacity to make this decision. In terms of children, guardians are able to consent on behalf of their children. However, this issue rises for young adults who might feel like they get they are um, deserving of more autonomy over their decisions. And we're going to go through that a little bit as well through some of the case studies that we're going to look at. So the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 established some of the um, criteria for capacity. And it assumes that all adults, so that everyone over 18, has capacity. So that is the assumption under the Mental Capacity Act. And if a physician is in doubt over whether a patient has capacity, the four criteria have to be met. So the patient has to be able to understand the information related to the decision, retain the information for long enough to make a decision, weigh up the information to make an, un uh, to make an informed decision, and they have to have the ability to communicate this, the, their decision back to the doctor. So if one of these four criteria is not met and the patient does not have capacity, and the doctor is expected to then act in the best interest of the patient when deciding on treatment plans. So here we see one case in which capacity um, is quite confusing and you know where, where a patient might not necessarily have capacity and where um, autonomy might differ. So even though autonomy is one of our four pillars of medical ethics, capacity is a necessity for autonomy. So that's something to keep in mind. And we're now gonna look at Gillick competency. So we said under the Mental Health Act of 2005, all individuals above 18 are assumed to have capacity. And for 16 and 17 year olds, they are usually assumed in most cases to be able to make decisions for themselves without parents and are able to consent for themselves. However, this issue becomes a bit more murky for under 16s. So um, a good case study here is um, Gillick competency or something that is useful to be aware of. So this begins with Victoria Gillick, who was a woman who opposed the provision of contraceptive advice to individuals aged under 18, under 16, sorry. And this was because her daughter had been offered contraceptive advice by a GP without the consultation of her parents, and she was 15, so she was a minor. And um, in the court case, Gillick versus West Norfolk and Wisbeck Area Health Authority, we um, it was found that, well, it was decided that a minor, anyone under 16, is able to consent to medical treatment when a minor is deemed to have capacity. So again, we're thinking of those four checklist points that we looked at under the Mental Health Act of 2005, Mental Capacity Act of 2005, sorry. And we're thinking um, about this, but actually minors under 16 are also applicable to this. So if a physician thinks that a minor has capacity, they should be able to consent to medical treatment. And this is called Gillick competency. And it's something that's really useful to be aware of. And it does crop up in the news quite a bit as well, especially surrounding at the moment transitioning. So trans patients who want to undergo the um, physical surgical transitioning um, at the moment, um, there's a real, real big issue about um, the age at which individuals should be able to consent for this. Um, so that's something to maybe read up on a little bit more and try and apply some of these Gillick competency principles to. So we're gonna look at the ethics of child consent now. So in terms of autonomy, it should be the child's right to make decisions about their healthcare and this should be respected. And so we looked at that in Gillick Competency. That's something which um, Gillick Competency says that for minors under 16, their autonomy should still be respected and their autonomy still exists as long as the child has capacity for minors. We need to also think about beneficence. So is the treatment being offered in the child's best interest and is it protecting children through, is there um, 
we also need to think about protecting children in this sense. So is the treatment being offered to the child um, going, is it doing danger, is it doing damage, or is it the best interest of the child? So we have to think about that and whether a child is able to identify what their best, what is in their best interests. Um, so say for example, what if a child's unable to understand the implications of certain tests or treatments? So we need to have that in the back of our minds. In terms of non-maleficent, we should think, should parents be made aware if a child is involved in potentially dangerous activities for child protection? Say for example, if a 13 year old came up to you and asked you for contraceptive advice as a GP, we need to be thinking about the wider context of this. You know, this child could be in danger. You know, this is very young to be getting involved in um, this sort of thing. And, you know, say, say if um, you believe that the child is in a um, relationship that could be abusive or could be um, someone could be taking advantage of that child, should something be done to prevent harm here? And should this overwhelm patient autonomy in this instance? Um, but also in terms of non-maleficence, are we doing psychological damage to children by not allowing them to consent to their own procedures through patronizing them, through subjecting them to parents' wishes, which they might not be a fan of. So childhood consent is a very ethically complex topic. And we're gonna look through a question surrounding this in a little bit. Um, but again, it's totally within your right to acknowledge this in your answer to say that it is ethically complex and controversial. So we've looked at capacity in medicine and we've looked at how capacity varies with age and mental status. And now we're gonna look at some tips and tricks on how to tackle a question on capacity. So we're gonna keep on coming back to this slide from the general approaches to ethical dilemmas, which is the features of a strong argument. So a strong argument is concise, balanced, factual and structured. So we need to keep these in mind whenever we're thinking about an answer to an ethical question. So in terms of approaching the question, we want to give some background information on the topic. So this could be a definition of capacity and how this changes. So we could bring in Gillick competency or the Mental Capacity Act of 2005. Then we want to state the frameworks that we're going to use when answering, so the four pillars. And then we want to use the four pillars to provide a balanced argument. Again, you make your argument and then you supplement this with the four pillars. So you say, um, for example, you say, I believe that children should be able to um, consent to their own procedures because this um, empowers a child, it respects a child and it respects their own decisions. And this complies with one of the four pillars of medical ethics autonomy. So we make our argument and then we back it up with the four pillars of medical ethics. And we use this to provide a balanced argument. And then we want to reach a balanced conclusion in our answers. So now we're gonna look at a mock question together. So a 15 year old girl informs her GP that she is sexually active and would like to start contraception. So this is the ethical scenario. So let's think, up, think about how we would approach this ethical scenario in an interview. Pause the video and have a think. So firstly, we want to define capacity. So capacity is the ability to make a decision uh, and to weigh up the benefits and risks of a decision to come to informed conclusion decision. Um, so Gillick competency states that children can consent if they're deemed to have capacity. So we can go into um, a little bit more with Gillick competency or we could um, again, um, go into a little bit more about the definition of capacity and some of the thresholds for it, but we might not necessarily have to bring up the Mental Health Act, Mental Capacity Act of 2005 here, because it's not as relevant to the case, but it's always useful to know. Um, I'm going to base my answer partly on the four pillars of medical ethics, autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. And just reciting these is really, really useful, not only to consolidate it in your own minds, but also to show the interviewer that um, you have a good understanding of basic medical ethics. Then we want to discuss some of the ethical debates that we looked at earlier. So pro, we want to look at autonomy and beneficence and anti, we want to look at non-maleficence. And then we want to reach a balanced conclusion. Um, so the most immediate concern is that the child is practicing safe sex. So you would prescribe contraception, but encourage conversation with your parents openly about um, their sexual health or their sexual activity. Um, and it may also be good to familiarize yourself with something called the Fraser, Gate, uh, Fraser Guidelines which specifically look at the administration of contraception under 16 years old. So it gives some more information on that. And that might be useful to explore this a little bit more. So firstly, we want to, looking at some aspiring medics top tips to finish off, we want to use your background knowledge. So including information on the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 and Gillick competency. You can read around the topic using our website, theaspiringmedics.co.uk. Use pillars and frameworks as they add weight and structure to your argument, but again, remember to use it to support your larger argument. And remember, you don't need to have a definitive opinion. So you will not be judged on your opinion, much more important to revise the structures that you're going to use because interviewers will, looking, will be looking for you to be able to form an effective argument and use some of these medical frameworks well. 
So in this session, we've looked at what capacity is in medicine. We've looked at how capacity varies with age and mental status. We've looked at some tips and tricks on how to tackle a question on capacity. And finally, we've looked at a summary slide. So you should now be well prepared to tackle any question on capacity in your medical school interviews. To unlock the rest of the videos in this category, make sure to purchase the Aspiring Medics online interview course. We have over 50 videos covering seven categories, including COVID-19, the NHS and medical ethics. Head on over to www.theaspiringmedics.co.uk today to ace your med school interview.